down. Um, and yeah, far away. Who wants to be first cab off the rank? Don't be shy. And we're just asked to wait for the microphone to get to you before you start. Yeah, just one for you, Jason. Um, just wondering with the liming trials that have been been out for three or four years now, I know you've got the incorporated versus surface application. And just wondering with the wet seasons we've had where the surface applied stuff's up to in terms of movement down the profile? Yep. Yeah, so um, we've got we've got a range of trials around the landscape. Uh, like you say, surface applied and compared to incorporated. Um, it has been wet a couple of years of, of late, so some interesting, surprising, I would say exciting, because that's how I roll. Uh, at Menace, up near Tumbarumba, surf supplied only onto uh, existing pasture, we've got pH changes to 20 centimetres after three years, which that shouldn't have happened, right? And it has. Um, now, that soil in particular has quite high organic matter and it rained like 950 mils over two years, like two years of rainfall of 950, about that. Um, in drier places, we've got, uh, with FarmLink, trial at Tamora, surf supplied lime and incorporated with uh, offset discs, I think from memory, once and twice. And there, after three years, Statistically, the surface applied is just behind the incorporated. It's very, very close. And agronomically, the surface applied would be doing exactly the same as the incorporated. So that's a surprise too for me. It has happened faster than I thought. The key thing in all of that though, the movement that we get, we get that because we've hit a higher pH target. If you just put on lime and got a pH around five, it would not move. And we know that because we've got those treatments too, and they haven't. Um, and so it's that higher pH target, getting the pH up over five and a half, closer to six, allows the lime to move, move down. So that was, uh, so it's promising. It's good because what we thought was going to happen is happening. It's exciting because it's happening faster than we thought. That said, there are farmers that love machinery and they want to incorporate lime and, and more power to them. But if you didn't want to pull the trigger on that, on buying new machinery or whatnot, time is your friend. Very good. Andy. Next one. Don't be shy. I'll ask one for Jody. Um, we've got a, a lot of young guys, people, I should say, not guys, people in the room. Uh, probably some wannabe farmers. You guys have gone through a rapid period of growth, I would say, over that 10 year period. Yes. What would your top three tips be, um, given what you've experienced that 10 years? Um, first of all, okay, look at every opportunity that comes your way. Sometimes you won't see that that is necessarily aligning with what you currently think you're doing, but, you know, if it's something that you can do and you have the capacity to do, give it a go. Don't turn down any opportunity, no matter how big or small it is, because you just, you, you cannot fathom where that might lead to. It's one of the greatest things that I've learned in the last 12 years is things that I didn't necessarily think they were part of the overall goal, but you just never know where an opportunity is going to take you. Um, obviously, work hard. Like, we've done, um, we've minimised costs all the time by doing it ourselves. Like, even still, our operation at the moment is still only the three of us. It's Andrew and Tom and I. Um, that's it to, to run. We're currently running 18,000 sheep and across some 13,000 acres. So, you know, um, but work hard to a plan. Have a goal and a plan in place so that you know where you're working towards so that you can make the most of all these opportunities. And then, you know, um, you know that saying that the harder you work, the luckier you get. So I do, I am an advocate for having a plan, sticking to the plan, and take every opportunity that you can, no matter whether it looks, you might not be able to see what it, what, where it's gonna take you at this point in time, but you never know. Take it. Never turn down an opportunity. Great, thanks. Radio. Uh, 
Yeah, I've just got a quick question for probably both Richard and Carol around that mixed species stuff. Um, and all that data that you guys presented is, we see it in the paddock a lot with the flow and effect of a legume crop. We seem to see the following crop, if it's a, uh, the following crop after a legume, it always produces a lot more with a lot less inputs. Um, is there any data supporting that? And particularly the tool of like ryegrass control with the use of hay at the end of an early termination of some of those mixed species. Is there information or data around that that you guys have seen in your trials? Um, so I can speak to the the first question on the, the nitrogen. Um, and they say that the um, agronomy is the... Um, Agronomy is the capacity to continually be amazed at the effect of nitrogen, okay? So that's the field that we're in. Um, it's very real. That, that legacy effect of nitrogen is very real and it, and it can even last longer than a year. So it can go into the, you know, the second year after the, after the legume, um, particularly with, with you know, things like loosened pastures, you know, because those residues take a little bit longer. Uh, to break down. So, yeah, there, there's definitely data around on that. There's definitely local data. There's lots of good stuff out, you know, to more away and around Wagga here. Um, so that, that effect is definitely real. I'm not sure I can... Carol, can you comment on the hay? What was the second part of the question again? Sorry. Um, Just that extended benefit of the early termination of some of those mixed species. We've used it a lot as a term of ryegrass control, for example, where we'll graze early um, and spray out or make into hay to remove them and we see the added benefit the following year with that reed, weed seed set reduction. Yeah. Um, probably on the edge of your work a little bit, Carol, but I just wanted to know if you could comment on it. Yeah, we're not directly looking at that. We did have original plans to try and look at things like that, but um, we haven't been able to. But, um, yeah, I mean, definitely the, in legacy a bit, is, is real. We're seeing that in some paddocks that we've gone and looked at. Um, but in terms of the the hay and the ryegrass bit, I'm not. We we don't have enough data to be able to say that's a real effect or not at this stage. Sorry, I just just remembered there there is um, a fair bit of data from about 15 years ago around the early termination of pastures and particularly the the effect of water. So, you know, you're conserving water in that late spring and then that's, that's there in the, in the soil for, for the following crop. So there's definitely a legacy effect of water on those early terminations. There also is a little bit of data from Tony Swan, uh, a site I believe was at Illibo somewhere, Yurungilly that way. Two years of silage or two years of early termination reduced ryegrass seed um, numbers well down from say two, two to two and a half thousand per square metre to less than 50. So that, that information's out there. Thank you. Yeah, just to Jody, um, you're doing huge amounts of measurement on the stocks enterprise or stock part of the business. What about the measurements in relation to pasture, soil health, soil nutrition, biomass development, all that type of thing is along, along the same lines. My, Andrew would have been able to answer all of these questions a lot more. My focus tends to be on the Merino enterprise and I collect all the data there and I, so I can't tell you what, it, I can't speak with anywhere near as much um, experience or authority on the, the cropping data, but Andrew and Tom are, they are doing soil testing and they are measuring all of that. They are constantly monitoring the biomass and monitoring the food on offer and rotating the livestock grazing and managing the crops. We've, we particularly, at the end of last year, we were managing, um, assessing crops to take the opportunity to say some crops that um, were, that did sort of come strangely enough came to a bit of a dry finish and they weren't doing that good. So we thought, well, we'll sacrifice those crops and use them to graze weathers on because we have to, we're really mindful of keeping the grass seeds and like the, the um, spear grass and the, um, the, um, it's the other, um, one of those really bad ones that gets into the carcasses. So we used a crop, we used a crop to graze to keep all the grass out of the, out of the weathers. So they're monitoring that all the time. So I can't answer that with anywhere near as much authority as Andrew would be able to, but they're on it and watching it and making sure we can utilise the pastures for the, for the optimum management for that and to manage the sheep in the best possible way. Yeah. 
Jason, I just had a question about the, the studies that you did, um, and you did it over two years, and I got the, the understanding that if you continued to monitor that over, over you know, another two to four years past that, that you would continue to see improvement with time. Have I got that right? That, that it, you, it, the longer that you can leave it, and how long would you leave it before you did another lot of planting? So this is the, like, liming trials, is that what you mean? Yep. Yeah. Um, so the movement, we do annual sampling in our trials because we want to track movement, and, uh, and we still get changes every year. Um, so things will move. There's got to be a reason for it to move. That is, there needs to be... Like once the lime's been consumed, then clearly there's nothing to move now. Um, but the way we've set things up, the pH is always higher at the surface and that's where we put the lime. So it will be dissolving more slowly because it's not as acid. Um, and so I think that's why we're getting that every year you get this slight change. How long that lasts for, I can't answer that question because it's going to depend on what your starting point was how much lime you put on and how fast that system is acidifying because the better people are at farming, the faster they acidify the soil. And so there's a process going both ways there. Some, some of those processes are going faster one way than the other as well. So it's dynamic, which just means that we need to go and soil sample again. It's not a once in a lifetime thing. We need to be doing it every three years, say, in the same paddock. Um, and that will pick up where you're at. And so one of the things to do is to uh, think about making a graph of your pH and some, some um, sampling systems actually do this for you. Uh, a graph with, say, pH or cobalt P or whatever it is you're interested in looking at uh, and time and then look at what, what would be possible outcomes from your farming and your management if you sampled every second year. What's that graph look like? Dot, 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 up and down. What if it was every three years? What if it was every five years? What if it was one in eight? I know people that sample one in eight in a cropping rotation, sort of like, you know. Um, those graphs get really sparse on information real quick once you start spreading those samples out. Whereas every, every two years, every three years, you kind of see the trends develop and you can make an intervention to improve it along the way. Um, so is that where you're sort of coming to with that question about time? Is that just, just trying to work out um, how often you reseed and and how much you treat because I use um, an alpaca worm casting fertilizer. I don't use lime. I, I'm trying to bring the balance back naturally. So I realise that that's going to take time. And I, you don't throw artificial materials at it, um, I'm trying to do it through cropping, sorry, through through cutting and grazing um, yeah. and, and a natural fertiliser mix. And I know it takes longer to do that, but I'm, I don't know enough about the measuring. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to grasp is, is from what you were doing, you're doing fairly intensive, but by, by the sound of it, if every three years I tested, I would get a better sense of how often I need to do whatever. Yeah. So there's nothing more natural than mining a rock out of the ground and grinding it up real fine and spreading it out on the ground, right? That's natural. Um, but no, so, so, pack so, poop. so so <laughs> with um, with what you're talking about, like monitoring is the key, right? And what you're trying to do is harder than than buying lime in, and harder than than you know buying implement uh, buying. Uh, amendments in and doing stuff with. So monitor is the key. So if I, if I was you, I'd, I'd be locking myself into a, a soil measuring strat, uh, system or strategy that relies on reasonably regular intervals to have a look at what you're doing, how quickly is it working? Because you could be doing stuff that's not changing what you want to change and you need to know that. And the only way you're gonna know is by looking at what's happening in your pasture and by looking at some of those numbers. And so, like, Jody's talk this morning was super um, interesting to me because fundamentally it was um, managing a complex system 
with data. It's data. You, there's so much of that talk was about getting information so I can make decisions about improving, making the improvements where I want to make them. And so um, I think as managers, data is a, a massive tool, but you've got to be willing to look at it, look for what it's telling you, and make um, decisions based off it to achieve the targets you want. Without that data, it's guessing. You're not really managing if you're not measuring. Yeah. A question for Alison. After being involved in our Farming Smarter program, uh, and in hindsight, what, uh, what would you do different in that program F from, say, our project design or from the way you went through that program? Um, what would you change? Well, the first thing, I wouldn't let my husband change paddocks, but that's another argument that I'm going to lose. Um, look, there's an, a number of things. Um, the grid sampling was really interesting in terms of giving us a, a spatial pattern to look at. I think it was probably not the way to go. I think there was better ways to spend money. Um, and if we had to pay for it entirely ourselves, then um, I would have chosen certain parts of the paddock to do it in uh, and, you know, that I knew were different and producing differently. Um, I think that would have been a, a, a thing that would have happened rather than doing a set grid sampling. I think it was a bit inefficient. Um, the other thing is... It measured 0 to 10, 10 to 20 centimetres, and we've just heard from Jason today why best practices moved on from that, um, because it gave us, definitely gave us a lot more information than we had, and we could build prescription maps, but I don't think it, um, it would have given us additional information and would have helped us understand just how severe that incremental um, stratification was in that first couple of layers. Um, the other thing that concerned me, I think, about the program was the way the liming rates were calculated, uh, in that the same formula was used for the, no the 10 to 20 as the 0 to 10. And to me, knowing that there's big soil differences in those layers, that doesn't quite make sense, and Jason might like to comment on that in a, in a bit more detail. So they're probably the key things, I think. We, uh, the idea, the concept was great. I think that there's finessing around best practice that we could do around how we gather the information for soil sampling and interpret that for this. The other thing that I would have liked to have done is probably go back, and it was just a timing thing for us. We couldn't get back to the past, uh, the paddock when we saw the the deficiencies occurring in our in our cover paddocks in our in our um, crops prior to sowing to find out whether what was going on. Looking back at the soil tests the other day, there was it was obvious that boron was quite low, and I suspect that or molybdenum or manganese, one of those trace elements, when we did such a quick shift in pH, actually caused problems. And I think just going back and doing some testing on those, tissue testing on those plants would have really helped. Did you want to make a comment? He disagrees with me. Yeah, it was probably Molly, yeah. Very good. Well, I think that's the uh, end of our question session. So just thank our speakers once again. Thanks.